So we are back in Tin Can and today it is for a record breaking, at least as far as my personal best is concerned, a record breaking run on the hardcore survival mode, which in this case I was pretty pleased with just because I was playing in the bigger part, which as I've said before, is definitely more challenging because of the distances that you have to cover. And of course, it's also got the latest update that has the fire and a couple of other things that I'll talk about later in the video. So uh, I'll start talking about the strategy that I had specifically in this case to try and survive for longer than I usually would. And of course, I did the standard thing of getting rid of all of the batteries and systems where I don't really need them. But I also straight away went and dismantled a bunch of systems that I really didn't think I need uh, or needed. So I started with the backup lights. Um, I like keeping the main lights on now. If I'm going to disable one of the light systems, I'd rather it be the backup lights since I don't keep batteries in the systems anyway. I also, as you can see, stripped out the uh, repair box basically and the battery charging system. And then the final thing that I took out right at the beginning was one of the processors in the main computer. So the reason for that is that you don't need two processors in there. I think that it slows things down a little bit if you don't have the second processor in there. But the thing is that in some cases, if in the main generator that processor fails, that is not something that you can play without. You do need to have a working processor in there. Otherwise, it will just endlessly increase the temperature and the power output to the point where it starts frying systems. And of course, it can kill the player with the heat in the pod as well. So in terms of the other systems that I dismantled, there are basically two reasons why I did this. The first reason in this case was just because, and I've mentioned this in the past, that if you take a component out of a system, it can't get damaged in the asteroid fields. And with the asteroid fields being as brutal as they are right now, you really want to get rid of any system that isn't absolutely critical, which brings me on to the second reason, which is that these systems that I disabled, you either are never going to need in the game or there's a good chance that within the first 20, 30 minutes, you probably won't need to use them. So if I just go through them one by one, of course, you don't need to light systems. In fact, you don't need any light systems because you have a flashlight, but it's always useful to have one switched on because, of course, the, the battery on your flashlight goes out pretty quickly and it, it is just a little bit annoying and, and sometimes difficult to have to play with that the whole time. Then as far as the battery system is concerned, well, you if you take out all of the batteries out of systems that you don't need, in my case, I take it out of literally every single system aside from the, uh, the CO2 generator, because that's the one system that you pretty much always need to have running. But everything else you can get away with having it switched off, at least for some of the time. Um, and then, of course, there's the repair box itself. And even though I've seen in some of the reviews, at least early on when the game was released, people would make a big deal about the fact that the whole game is sort of centered around the repair box. And if you've played some kind of lot, you'll know that that's not true. In this case, we have a survival run um, that's going to go for... I, I don't know if I should say at this point, but I guess I'll, I'll probably put it into the thumbnail. So we are going to go for over an hour here. And that's by completely dismantling the repair box right from the start. And of course, I've mentioned this in the past. If you are using the repair box, the amount of parts it gives you relative to the uh, component that you're scrapping, you're losing out. It doesn't give you all the parts that that component is made up of. So every time you scrap a part, essentially you are sacrificing, or every time you scrap a component rather, you are sacrificing some parts and you are much better off just substituting components in cases where you can. The repair box is really something that you should use if you have no other spare components left and you have to fix one in order to get out of the situation that you're currently in. But really that does not come up a lot. So all of these systems were uh, disabled at the start and that meant that I had a massive amount of spare parts right at the beginning of the game. And it also meant that I wouldn't have to worry about these systems breaking. I wouldn't have to keep an eye on them. Wouldn't have to worry about fires breaking out in those systems. So basically that's everything that was done at the start of the game. Now, I want to talk about some of the changes that have been made to Tincan since uh, uh, the latest couple of updates were released. 
And I'll start with some of the biggest ones and then I'll sort of work my way down to some of the smaller but also very important changes. So of course they've recently implemented the storage which is great. You can see here I'm busy just sorting stuff into the storage drawers which is definitely useful. Um, I'll, I'll mention a quick small change. You'll see that battery that I just removed from the uh, gravity generator. That is a new higher capacity battery and I think the reason that was included is in the past when the power went out, the gravity generator would basically tear through all of the power that is in that normal battery so quickly just because it uses so much power. So I think what the developers did to balance that out is they gave it that high capacity battery, which I still wouldn't recommend that you keep in there because it's really not good that every time you switch off the power, you're using uh, battery power for that you really don't need to use that so effectively what it becomes is a high capacity battery that you can use in every other system when you need to have backup uh, backup power so that's a really nice one to have so there's the storage there's the, the backup battery then of course there is the big one which is the fire update and this is what really makes these runs challenging right now. So you'll see uh, what's happening over here is I'm switching off the main generator. And I think the only systems that I kept operational in this case was the temperature regulation because this is the uh, solar flare event, if that's what it's called. And um, of course, also the CO2 system, which you pretty much always need to have functional. Uh, oxygen, I believe I was just, you'll see over here, I was just manually venting that. And um, that is probably, this is another system that you could probably get away with just completely disabling this. I'll get back to the oxygen and the CO2 in a second because there was a pretty big change there as well. But just back on the fire update. So right now I know that there's one way that I've verified within the sandbox that you can start fires and that is by overloading systems with electrical uh, basically just with the amount of power that's coming through being more than what the system can handle and particularly in cases where you don't have a fail safe so of course you have your power transformers there's a limit to how much power they can actually handle before the system needs to shut down in which case that is going to be reliant on the fuse if you have a functional fuse that will shut down the system and that will prevent damage now if say for example in an asteroid storm let's just say both the fuse and the power transformer get damaged at the same time and there's probably a couple of other things that can happen as well that could cause a power overload which is going to start damaging components within that system and when that happens every time a component gets damaged due to a power overload there's a chance that a fire breaks out so from what i can see it's not a guarantee it doesn't happen every single time but every time there is a chance that that can happen that can definitely make things a little bit tricky and then of course there's also the possibility or at least i think that in some cases it's just the hit itself that causes the fire but really it's impossible for me to tell i don't know if the fires are happening as a result of just being hit or every time it is a short that's happening but either way uh, the frequency of these in some cases can be quite high and as i've mentioned before if you miss that fire if you don't get it immediately it can, in addition to the damage that's being done because your fuse or your power transformer is failing uh, potentially at the same time, it can just burn up the whole system and it does not take long for that to, to happen. So I, I kind of hope that the developers will balance that out because I think in the current build, that part is quite challenging. Uh, but moving on to some of the other changes. So we've discussed the uh, the storage, the extra battery and the um, gravity system, and then of course the fires. Then there is the, also in the asteroid storms, you can basically get these little holes that are punched into the ship and that's how atmosphere um, is escaping. I think on balance, this change has actually made the game, or it, it's obviously made things more difficult in terms of you have to find these and plug them to make sure that you don't lose atmosphere. But what the developers did to balance this out is they basically uh, made the bottles, so the CO2 and the O2 bottles, um, take longer to drain effectively. And that means, I think that's a really welcome change. It just means that the game is so much more balanced overall and you don't have to constantly switching out tanks, so the CO2 and the O2 tanks. It also means that, of course, uh, it is it does make that 
event less dangerous because if, if you had the old tanks in there, you, um, you just wouldn't have enough atmosphere overall within the pod. So that would become a problem. So I'm really happy that they did that. It, uh, you know, with the fire and everything, it's definitely not easier than it used to be before, but it makes it a little bit less fiddly and a little bit less micromanagey around that particular aspect uh, as with respect to the O2 and the CO2 bottles. So, um, and then of course, the other thing is they still recharge as fast as they used to. So that means that you have a little bit more leeway um, when things go wrong with the, uh, say CO2 to O2 converter, you're going to have quite a bit of time before you actually have to deal with that. And given everything that happens in a, in a given run, I, I do think that is a good thing. So, yeah, I mean, for the most part, those are all the changes that I can see, aside from the fact that I am, of course, in this case, playing in the bigger pod. Um, and uh, yeah, from what I'm going to do from here forward, so I'm obviously not doing the voiceover in this one as I'm playing. I think that's probably one of the reasons why I was able to survive uh, for a little bit longer, because really in this game, you have to concentrate when you're playing in hardcore mode. And that can be hard to do uh, if you're trying to do the commentary at the same time, or at least it is for me, for somebody that's been running a YouTube channel for uh, what is it, probably three or four months right now. From here, I'm basically just going to jump to some of the main events that happened during the survival run, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to do the full uh, survival time in this case, just because I think that, especially on these longer runs, watching the whole thing, I don't know if it's that engaging. Uh, you guys can let me know in the comment what you'd like to see, but I think that I definitely don't want to be in a situation where I just upload the whole video or I don't have anything interesting to say. And unfortunately with Tin Can, if you've watched a lot of these videos, there are sections where I wouldn't say there's downtime, but there's maybe just not that much happening, at least from a person watching's perspective. Uh, so yeah, let's look at some of the highlights and we'll kind of talk through those as we go. So we're skipping to the middle of the next asteroid field and what you'll see here is so there's a couple of leaks that i need to plug but there was one hit that came sort of unexpectedly and took out or at least it damaged the main generator and luckily i immediately noticed that there was some sort of short that caused a fire and i could react to it pretty quickly i'm sort of fumbling around here because of course the gravity had gone and i'm trying to find a place to hold on to so that i can just get to the fire extinguisher and i pretty much immediately take care of that fire but this is just one example of if you don't see it immediately if you don't react to it immediately it would have taken probably most of the components out of that system with it and it would have made it really challenging to uh, to deal with this situation um, so yeah, luckily I managed to get on top of this one quite quickly. If I didn't, I think that would have probably ended my run within the next five minutes or so, I would imagine. Um, I mean, not necessarily, but it would have been it would have been quite difficult to deal with. But under these circumstances, I just sort of continued uh, plugging the holes that was caused by the asteroid event. And I just then went about uh, trying to sort of just diagnose if everything with the main generator was still okay, because of course, that's the, the one continuous source of power. So you do need to make sure that that is sorted out. So we're skipping ahead quite a bit to the first electric storm that we, or electric storm event that we had to go through. Now, what happened since the previous bit that we looked at is basically I completely disabled the main computer. It, I could see that it wasn't working, but I couldn't figure out exactly why. And I just didn't have time to try and diagnose that. So. I decided I'd rather just use the spare parts, take the spare parts from it, and I will sort of have to deal with diagnosing systems without having that or just looking up the codes in the manual. Um, so yeah, I basically had that disabled. In terms of this electric event, this one was pretty by the numbers. I just went through, switched off every system like I always do. Um, and then as usual, the first one that I go for is I just re-enable the CO2 system. Um, I don't bother with the oxygen system at all. I don't waste batteries on that at this point. I just manually vent the oxygen. And then as far as the uh, temperature regulation system is concerned, I usually just keep that off until I absolutely cannot do that anymore. So essentially, I just sort of wait it out until it starts getting really cold in the pod. And I have some sense of at, one, at what point it starts to get close to the, the lethal range. And that's when... I re-enable that system, just get a little bit of heat back into the system until I can see that the electric event has passed. Uh, 
Uh, but essentially, as I said, this one was pretty by the numbers. So if you uh, if you have all of the components that you need and you are familiar with dealing with the electric storm, it goes from being probably the most brutal event, especially for new players, to probably one of the easier ones to deal with, aside from the fact that you obviously don't have power and you just need to always make sure that you have at least one or two spare batteries to keep getting the CO2 out and uh, to get some temperature in using the temperature management system if you do need to do that. So jumping forward about 10 minutes, we had gone through another asteroid field that was absolutely brutal and you'll see that the CO2 is rising. That's because one of the things that got damaged was the CO2, uh, the oxygen pump or actually not oxygen pump, just the pump that was in there. And that meant that I had to keep swapping that out. So I was sort of monitoring the CO2 levels, then monitor monitoring the pressure as well, because in this case I was using the same pump from the pressure management system. And then as I was sort of checking around, I realized at this point, so you'll see um, as I'm turning around here, I realized that the uh, recycling station that takes the CO2 to O2 is no longer functioning. And I'm sort of just trying to switch that back on, realize that's not working. So I spent quite a bit of time from here uh, trying to figure out exactly what had broken in that system. Um, of course, this was during the Ice Nebula event at this point, which is probably, in my opinion, the easiest event to deal with. It does mean that you have lower temperature, lower power output, but it's actually pretty easy to deal with. There's a lot of different ways that you can deal with this event. So jumping forward to the 50 minute mark, and we are really in dire straits here. So you'll see I'm manually venting oxygen. That's because I don't have any other options. I also at this point, so we're in an electric storm. We had yet another asteroid field. There are so many broken components. It's impossible for me to keep track at this point. So basically I hadn't been able to fix the uh, CO2 to O2 converter. So this tank that I'm carrying, which already has some uh, CO2 in it, this is basically the last tank that I have that I can still use to extract some of the CO2 from the pod. So at this point, I know that it's only a matter of time because I have no way of uh, basically venting out the CO2 that's in these tanks. And of course, I can't just vent it into the pod. That would defeat the purpose of, of putting it into that system in the first place. I kind of know that it's just going to be a matter of time now. And it's really just a case at this point of dealing with every problem as it comes up and then knowing I am limited by the amount of space that there's left in the CO2 canister to extract CO2 from the air. But then, of course, as we jump forward, uh, there was yet another asteroid event. Not that it mattered at that point of all of the damaged components. And then I had another ice nebula. Not that that mattered too much. But you'll see here, I'm sort of desperately trying to see if there's anything that I can do with this recycling system. Because at this point, I had no space left within the CO2 tanks. I'd already started trying to manage the rest of the atmosphere by venting oxygen, venting more of the nitrogen into the air as well uh, because i just don't have the option of taking co2 out of the air anymore so the only way i can do that right now is by actually opening up the airlock and, and just letting some of the atmosphere overall escape you can see i'm unsuccessfully trying here to fix stuff within that recycling system but it's not working out in this case uh, the atmospheric pressure in the pod is, uh, or actually the atmospheric temperature is very high at this point, uh, but because I'm in the ice nebula, I sort of know that that will sort itself out. And then you'll see that um, here I'm literally just venting the last of the nitrogen out into the atmosphere just to sort of balance out the high amount of CO2 that we have in the atmosphere. And then basically doing the same thing with the oxygen as well. So that kind of exhausted the last of the atmosphere that I had left in canisters. So the only thing remaining now is effectively the CO2. So at this point, I know that there's really nothing else for me to do. I just kind of have to start waiting it out at this point. And then you'll see my final sort of last ditch desperate attempt to get this converter working again. 
And this is something that I should have done much earlier on. And in hindsight, it's incredibly easy to see that. But in this case, I just took out all of the rest of the electrical components so that I don't have to worry about power surges from the main power source. I just put a battery into it and I just swapped it out for another switch, which didn't seem to be working initially, but then I did get it switched on. And of course, this is a huge learning for me that you don't actually, if a system is broken or there's some electrical issue with the power transformer, with the fuse, you have the option of just taking those components out, popping in a battery and uh, just switching it on. And that should take care of the problem. But of course, that wasn't the only problem at this stage. I think that most likely the pump was broken as well. And this was kind of it. The writing was on the wall. and. I uh, basically ended right after the 64 minute mark, which for me is, as I said, a new record in Tin Can and pretty happy that I was able to pull this off within the bigger part and with the latest update. Uh, but that's kind of where it ended on this one. So I hope you've enjoyed watching this. As always, if you like this kind of content, do like and subscribe and I'll see you for the next video.